Looks good. Good. So, um, <laughs> hello from myself, Matthew Edney, and... And from me, Mary Pedley, and very pleased to be here with you tonight as we talk about uh, this volume of the History of Cartography series that was a long time in preparation and published and appeared a year ago now. Um, and we really welcome this chance to talk to you more about it. Our talk is focused on three things this evening. The purpose of the History of Cartography series and this volume in particular, its design and how it looks in the printed book and the meaning of cartography or map making in the European and Latin. Okay, and just a polite reminder, everybody, if you can mute, life will be easier. So the series as a whole, whoops, um, as Curtis began um, in his introduction by saying, uh, it's a six volume series. Volume one appeared in 1987. Uh, followed by three books of Volume 2 and Volume 3 in 2007. Mark Momin is Volume 6 in 2015, European Enlightenment Now, and then Volume 5, which is in preparation. That date, don't believe it. Um, the point of this series as a whole is to study maps as human artifacts um, and to study the processes of map making all the way from prehistoric times up to the 20th century. Um, and it's dedicated to rethinking the history of maps and mapping from two different perspectives. And to illustrate our talk, we're going to be using images from volume four and they all these images note what article they illustrate. As Matthew said, the purpose of this series is to rethink the history of maps from two particular perspectives. The first is that map making, that the series grounds map making as maps as social instruments that function at all levels of society. And here in this painting, we see King Louis XIV of France proudly showing his ministers his knowledge of the fortified towns that he had recently conquered along the Rhine by pointing to a manuscript map of the very area he has conquered. Maps like this you know, were made by Louis's military engineers. They remained mostly in manuscript, as you can tell from the map in this painting. And they were circulated among officers and royal administrators. When they were reproduced in print with royal privilege, these maps also became prop powerful propaganda tools for the Sun King. This painting itself adorns the ceiling of the Hall of Mirrors, the grandest room at the Palace of Versailles. And so it would be seen by all who visited. And maps were also, the, the second insight, maps are also uh, cultural documents. Um, this world map, for example, by Charles Price, published by George Wildey in London in 1714, shows the world in two hemispheres using a surprisingly oblique or tilted projection. But across the bottom, you can see it advertises all the different kinds of things, uh, the mathematical instruments, the spectacles, the snuff boxes and firearms and everything else that George Wildey sold at his shop, the great toy store, uh, just down the hill from St. Paul's Cathedral in London. It's the kind of printed map that was not particularly expensive and was commonly available to any customer who saw it in a shop window or who saw it advertised in the emerging daily press. When we think about the Enlightenment, we think not only about a particular period of chronological time. Our dates that are covered in this volume go from around 1650 to around 1800. But the Enlightenment in the sense of cartography doesn't represent just that next chunk of chronological time. It's also a discrete period of map history that's marked by several characteristics. One of which was a growing demand for maps. 
this period was a relative a time of relative peace and prosperity and it brought a growth in the map trade as seen here with his shop of Petrus Schenk who was a map engraver and publisher in Leipzig. The flip side of increased demand is increased literacy. Uh, maps became um, a key element of educational uh, of education I should say and not only for the specialized and the elite, but all the way down into the middling sort, uh, even to some degree into the working classes. Um, here's a picture of some children of a nobleman um, at their studies, learning how mm. to paint, learning uh, how to take measures off uh, a globe, for example. Geography texts and maps were used both at home and in schools as well as in uh, military establishments, navigational schools, and so forth, uh, promoting mapping across society. Another aspect of this period of map history was the growth in institutions that were created for scientific study and the development of instruments such as a telescope which were amplified by royal or government support. So these private institutions uh, like the Royal Observatory that you can see on the left in Paris were paid for by the monarchy, both in their design and their staffing and in their upkeep and in the programs that they, that they envisage. Or the creation of very expensive instruments like the Jesse Ramsden's great theodolite that you see on the right also supported by government funding. So these characteristics of the enlightenment as well as those purposes of map making as social instruments and cultural objects, how do they play out on the printed pages of volume four of the history of cartography? We're going to give you a little sneak peek inside those pages to show you how the volume is arranged and organized uh, when you open it up. And hopefully it's not too much of a sneak peek because hopefully you'd all have bought the book by now. But <laughs> if you haven't, this is what it looks we like. Hope this um, so volume four, like volumes five and six, is organized as an interpretive encyclopedia. So within the volume, the entries are arranged in alphabetical order, uh, but they've been conceptually designed around um, what we're thinking of as representational context, the ways, the different ways in which mapping was undertaken and in which maps were used. And this is one example out of the nine representational contexts in the volume. This is the, uh, uh, at the left, we got the initial start of the entry on boundary surveying. And then on the, to the right, we've got a spread of a couple of those pages. And you'll notice that, um, you know, we think of an encyclopedia as being a single entry, single entry, single entry. But for many of our entries, they fall together again into thematic holes. And so for these particular modes of mapping, such as boundary surveying, we've arranged them within what we call composite entries. So on the left, you have the initial uh, beginning of um, the boundary surveying entry, which is then subdivided into, more, uh, into other separately written by separate expert entries on boundaries of veying in the Enlightenment, in the Austrian monarchy, in Denmark and Norway, in France and New France, and so on. Um, I think we have 25 different spatial contexts. Um, and so some of these composite entries get quite large <laughs> when you have all of these um, different kinds of mapping. And one of the reasons we've done this, there's, there's several reasons we, we, we've, we've gone this way, is so that people, our readers, can start to um, see connections in terms of the kinds of mapping, the kinds of uses of mapping between uh, different areas. So you can start to see how cartography is becoming increasingly institutional and international uh, across Europe and the European colonies through the 18th century. And so the reader can look through boundary surveying, 
through the different kinds of boundary surveys and maps that are produced and can start to see for themselves what are the connections, what are the differences uh, across the practice of mapping political boundaries across Europe. Every entry um, is illustrated with examples. Uh, there is about one image for every 1,000 words of text, so 954 images in all. You'll also notice that they're full color, uh, a very nice thing, uh, makes this volume very, very pretty. Um, and also, I'm not sure if it's in here or later, it's later. I'll go back to Mary now. <laughs> The volume not only covers processes of map making, but it also covers larger themes in the political context of the long 18th century. Here we have as an example, the entry on indigenous peoples and European cartography. Again, the illustrations range from the depiction of a full map, such as the Petrini map of Africa on the left. Of course, its very size dictated that it be presented sideways in the book. And uh, we have uh, a local collection, the McLean collection to thank for this particular image. We're very appreciative. It's a very rare map. And so we were delighted to be able to procure it from the McLean collection. To the detail, of a well-known cartouche on the right that you can see of a native inhabitant and map maker on a manuscript map of Sabará in Brazil. You'll notice at the bottom right that every entry, when you come to the end and after the author's names, every entry is supported by, first of all, a see also. This is cross references to all the related articles in the volume that are connected to the idea of indigenous peoples in European cartography. And then it's followed by a rich bibliography on the topic so that you as a reader can go further and deeper into anything that interests you or appeals to you in the volume. This is not the only way to find things in the volume, as Matthew will explain. Indeed. Um, so what we have here, so, we, so the, the, the Table of contents is the most obvious way of, of accessing entries. Uh, and again, all the entries are arranged in the volume alphabetically um, with some nice um, turning around of things so that not everything doesn't all bundle down under cartography and the economy, cartography and religion. Mm -hmm. We put the economy and religion at the front. Uh, there is also an index. Uh, the entire volume is fully indexed, quite rare for an encyclopedia. Um, which goes into all the deep, even finer details than uh, the main entry terms of each entry. Um, we also have at the, uh, on the end papers of the volume, uh, and on the right here, you can see part of this. Um, we have the layout of the volume as we created it within the, the, the various hierarchical contexts which allowed us to design and, and, and to comprehend the entirety of this huge topic. And so if you're interested in issues, for example, about how people surveyed and observed and measured the landscape, um, there's a whole series of different kinds of entries that you can look at in this index guide on, on, the, on the end papers, and that will guide you into the volume as a whole. As Mary said, there the see also's. And then finally, um, Mary and I have, have, have decided that, frankly, the best way to, to really get into this volume, if you don't quite know what to do, because it's such a big thing, you know, 2,000 pages, um, flip through it. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to see a picture that, that, that grabs you and you want to learn more about it, well, start reading. And then follow the see also's. Uh, there are a few in, uh, in text cross references as well. Um, and read around, and you'll find all sorts of wonderful things you didn't know you needed to know. But perhaps the best way to be introduced to this volume 
is to read the introduction. The introduction, of course, Matthew and I wrote the last at the end because we didn't really know what we had learned from it until it was finished. And I think it's fair of me to say that we enjoyed writing the introduction most of all. It, it was uh, so gratifying to really be able to look at this work and think about what did we learn? And what we learned was that we found that there's no single narrative that explains map making in the enlightenment. We found that the usual narrative of progress and improvement and a quest for accuracy was not adequate, did not explain what was going on in map making. Because when we studied the different processes of map making in depth, we realized that a different model was required for understanding the complex cultural, social, and technological changes that affected map making. So as I mentioned, um, we have these, these bigger contexts in which we design the volume. Um, and one of one set of those contexts are the, what we can think about as top down mapping. Uh, mapping of spaces that are larger than, than the map maker's person. Um, and so we're talking about geographical mapping, mapping regions, mapping the world, mapping the cosmos to some degree, celestial mapping, marine mapping of the sea, thematic mapping of distributions of people and geology and such like. Um, this kind of mapping is done by a number of people, both educated and more literate, members of society, mostly men, aristocrats, gentry, the middling sort, includes a commercial marketplace for printed materials and they're such they circulate widely. But then in a variation, so marine mapping in particular is done by, as we'll talk in more detail later, marine mapping uh, is done by mariners who may not necessarily be very well educated uh, and they're very conservative. And so you can start to see that as there are trends of um, knowledge practices that basically don't change that much in geographical mapping and marine mapping and celestial mapping, um, even as there are other trends that do change and then we have this tension of continuity and change that runs throughout the volume. The other way to think about um, mapping is the kinds of mapping that are bottom up. Um, kinds of mapping that can be done by one person or a small team of surveyors um, or very large groups of people, but in theory can be done by one person. And here we're looking at property mapping, topographical mapping, mapping of place, mapping of landscapes, urban mapping, mapping of cities, and boundary mapping, mapping of, of boundaries between poly, uh, political entities. And here we're looking at the professionals, so surveyors and engineers, trained laborers, skilled laborers in the case of property mapping, who are working for landowners and bureaucrats and royalty. These people, these kinds of mapping are less integrated into the marketplace and the maps tend to circulate in small numbers in manuscript. And as such, they're tied very closely to particular um, practices and traditions of practice. So again, as we get into this volume, you start to see that there are areas of innovation and there's areas of uh, continuity and um, con conservatism. And then I just got to say my own personal favorite, uh, just because geodetic surveying, uh, me me uh, measuring the size and shape of the earth, um, it sort of fits between the two. Uh, it's, it's top down, but it's done by bottom up um, and it's wonderfully complex. And this is really an area of, of extreme innovation, which I don't think we're gonna be talking about. We will do briefly. So anyway, so let's look at some of these examples of how mapping in each of these different categories, these different kinds of, of mapping, how they change or don't change over the course of the 18th century. Um, with the 18th century's changing cultural, economic, social circumstances. So the first example is property mapping. Property mapping for the 18th century 
is really not that much different from earlier periods. Um, this image of property mapping in the British colonies um, out of Georgia from 1784, actually this is independent Georgia, um, really isn't that different from what you would see uh, by surveyors in the Renaissance. And here's a picture of the surveyors. They're using very simple measuring, measuring instruments at the right. The surveyor is looking through a, a compass with a couple of sites uh, added on. And then he's followed by two chain men who are wielding uh, a length of chain, um, which in American colonies was introduced in the 1760s, replacing the older wooden rods, which, whose use go all the way back into antiquity. And just as surveyors were doing this kind of work in uh, the colonies, they were doing the same kind of work with the same kind of instruments back in Great Britain. This is uh, a group of men getting ready to do a uh, tithe survey, tithe survey or enclosure map, um, I should say, using uh, measuring rods and uh, the chaining arrows to hold them in place. You can see the same kinds of property mapping continuing across Europe. Here in the Netherlands, from the Netherlands is an example of uh, an estate plan, a very common image for landowners to have and to display. This is my territory, uh, very ornate. This one has in the lower left, a hunting scene. Um, in the lower right, a pastoral image of, of cows and a goat. Uh, together with this incredibly ornate gold cartouche. Um, but all talking to the, the experience of the land owner as an owner of property. And we have to add that not all property mapping was in a visual mode. Um, a lot of property mapping was just either measured just for the sake of measuring an area without a map being reduced, or in this case, uh, part of an Ottoman cadastral property register in um, Istanbul. The properties are laid out spatially, but in a textual format. Um, we included the Ottomans because, not because they're part of Europe, they were to large, I mean, large part of Europe was part of the Ottoman Empire, um, but there's a, there's a phenomenally interesting uh, narrative of how the Ottomans engaged with European concepts of, uh, of space and mapping practices through the 18th century. So in the 19th century, volume five, there's much more of a story of, of integration, um, but we needed to include the Ottoman Empire in volume four. As Matthew has pointed out, property mapping was one of continuity and so was urban mapping. It also continued long established surveying practices on the ground using the graphic representations of plan and view, often combining the both of them into one overall graphic design as with this plan of Berlin. A city administrations began more and more to encourage detailed surveys to create clearly defined and manageable space that was best seen by using the plan format. At the same time, the pictorial view helped the map user locate and connect with the urban fabric by showing familiar landmarks. So both the plan and the view persist throughout the enlightenment. But there was some innovation. There were new needs, new needs le that led to new practices, such as urban planning. The growth of cities required urban maps to reimagine, to help to reimagine the city with wider thoroughfares for cleaner air and ease of congestion. The naming and numbering of buildings, street lighting, and planning for growth. These were the concerns for enlightenment rulers, such as Tsar Peter I of Russia, who here is overseeing the creation of a new town, St. Petersburg in 1703, using the plan in hand. At the same time, 
the same artistic skills that employed the mathematics of perspective in the Renaissance uh, continued to be used to create another form of urban view, the panorama. And in this case, we have a panorama of London that was originally painted on canvas and then printed from six plates in aqua tint to create this 11 foot wide image of London. So it has a, a, a kind of oh wow factor um, that accompanies the panorama. It's looking at London from the south going across Blackfriars Bridge towards St. Paul's Cathedral as this detail shows you. And it also shows you the enormous care uh, that both the original artist and the engravers took to render the realism of this view, to make you the viewer feel that you were really there. Yet another area of continuity lay in the use of mapping by the military, in particular the military engineers. Um, engineers have been using maps since antiquity uh, in laying out fortifications and in particular. Um, in the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries, we see uh, a codification of colors and symbols uh, to enable fast and efficient map reading uh, and decision making. Um, now I should say, when you're looking at this kind of, of map out of France, uh, you see a wonderful, um, area uh, that a general can look at this and see quite quickly where they can and cannot put their troops. Um, you can see the fortifications around Saint-Omer. Uh, you see the valley uh, coming across the bottom of the, of the screen uh, between hills. You can see the breastworks. You can see the ridge where the uh, series of troops are encamped, those little yellow uh, rectangles. Um, getting ready perhaps to siege or there's, they're, they're just posted there. Um, you can also have this wonderful checkerboard landscape, which I just got to say, doesn't really mean each one of these is a field. It just simply means these are fields. <laughs> this is a, uh, so there's, there's areas of uh, fences and hedgerows, which of course would be difficult to move a soldier through, just as difficult as putting a soldier up a steep, deep dark slope. So the roads become really very important in this respect. The movement away from the kind of siege warfare of previous centuries to one that emphasizes open space warfare meant that the lie of the land became increasingly important in this period. And therefore new techniques were developed to represent particularly mountainous terrain or elevated terrain. Uh, these techniques included, uh, were especially um, efficacious in manuscript where you could use shading and color to great effect. As you can see on this detail of a manuscript map of a part of the Pyrenees called Les Eldudes that was made by uh, and geographical engineers for the French army in the latter part of the 18th century. We also included not only uh, techniques in manuscript mapping, but also uh, images of how things worked, including this a image of a manuscript image of an aerostatic balloon that was the image was attached to a surveying proposal that demonstrated the value of using a hot air balloon in topographical mapping. I've already mentioned <clears throat> that one of the areas of continuity in the 18th century was in marine mapping. Essentially, for most of the century from 1650 on, um, most marine charts were very similar, plain charts, very similar to what had gone, what had been made and used before 1640. But at the end of the um, 18th century, we have a new formation developing um, that we that's nowadays known as hydrography. Um, so on the one hand in this image from the, from the end of the 18th century, we have a lot of elements that deal with the, the traditional view of the sea. 
um, we have a, an emphasis upon the coastlines and low water. We have a network of rum lines um, that, although not quite in the traditional circular form. Um, and then we have an inset plan of the dominant fortress of Kronberg in Helsingor on the Danish side of the strait. But then if we look closely at this detail, you can start to see how the new techniques of, um, of hydrographic surveying start to be applied. Uh, you can see the, the numerous um, sp uh, soundings, that's the word I want, the numerous soundings. Uh, and you can see that they, they form straight lines and you can, you, can, you know that there's a ship that's sailing along a straight line, taking soundings uh, back and forth across the sound. Um, and to do that, they're using a new instrument called a station pointer um, that's introduced only in the 1770s uh, that allows uh, a ship to pinpoint its location with respect to three known fixed locations on the shore. So the hallmark of this new hydrography is actually shore mapping to fixed locations on the, on the ground against which you then define your location at sea on the water to define soundings and um, areas of shallows and mud banks uh, to position buoys and lighthouses and everything else that you need uh, to regulate shipping in a very, very um, frequented <laughs> portion of water. And I should say this, um, this particular survey uh, plan uses uh, data from the geodetic surveys done by the Dutch uh, authorities, which we will look at now. The innovation of geodetic surveying had a tremendous knock-on effect uh, in a number of regions throughout Europe. Uh, this effort to determine position on the curved surface of the globe. Matthew's already shown you how positioning of soundings were very, very important. It's no good having a number in the water if you don't know exactly where it is. And similarly, places on land were also becoming more precisely located through geodetic triangulation. And this survey of Denmark performed by Thomas Bouguet is seen here on this simple map that just shows his triangulation network. And with the detail, we can see that triangulation much more clearly. These are the triangles that form the basis for locating place on the map of the territory of the country. Uh, this work, of course, was inspired by the work of the Cassini family in France, whose carte de France really became a model for state surveys in many regions. And then another area of change is the area of, of thematic mapping. Um, in some respects, thematic mapping has a, has a long history. This early example, which we include, even though it's from uh, the late 16th century, um, shows kinds of soils uh, found in a polder in the Netherlands. And you've got the legend on the right-hand side uh, showing the quality of soils from uh, good, good fertile green soils down to uh, plain sand at the bottom in brown. Um, this kind of mapping uh, really starts to develop in the 18th century, both for very particular places, uh, but also global levels as well when um, scholars and administrators see the value of mapping out data, they start to map out mineralogical deposits, they start to map out um, religious distributions and so on. And so at the other end of the volume, this is from 1820s, so are really encapsulating the breadth of this volume chronologically. Uh, here is a uh, one of the soil maps from early, early 19th century Italy, the, the, the soils of Rome. And again, trying to understand the nature of the soils, um, partly in terms of building practice and, and, and so forth. 
but using the map as a way to map out data, to understand the data, to understand the landscape is utterly an 18th century innovation that's going to flourish in the, in the 19th century incredibly. And that's going to become a really major part of volume five. As Matthew pointed out earlier, uh, for every mapping process, there's a, a spatial context in which it's explored. And for every spatial context, there's an entry uh, for most, if not all, these modes of mapping. They're authored, each of these regions and mapping processes in the regions are authored by a specialist who has studied that mapping process specifically. And this resulted for us in a team of 207 contributors from all parts of Europe, South America, North America, Russia, and Turkey. But because volume four is in English, this also allowed us an opportunity to bring to the English speaking reader a wealth of research from other languages and bringing it to a much wider audience. So in summary, volume four contains 1 million words, 1920 pages, 954 full color images, some are very small, some are glorious broadsides. Four, all in 479 entries written by 207 contributors who are all experts uh, from 26 different countries. It really is a glorious work. Uh, and these cover images really uh, encapsulate, you know, the top down printed mapping on the left, the bottom up manuscript mapping on the right. French and German, um, a truly international effort like 18th century cartography. Oops, so thank you. Thank you and a, and a, and a special thanks to the Chicago Map Society for your continued support for so long uh, in helping us with this project. Um, a really special thank out a uh, shout out from Matthew and me to our associate editor in the audience tonight, Bob Caro, one of your members. And, and a particular note of, of thanks and friendship to Ken Nebenzal, uh, who for so long has been for us a stalwart friend and supporter. Um, we appreciate he, all he did for the history of cartography throughout his career. Finally, uh, we have on the screen a, the project's website. Um, if you go there, there's a page of volume four. There is a code there that is still valid to get 20% off. Not necessarily that cheap a book, I must admit, but it's, but compared to some recent academic books, this has got a lot of bang for the buck. It really does. That's a very expensive, very small books coming out recently. Anyway, um, there's also some information about other forthcoming talks. Mary and I will be doing one at some point that has still been scheduled. Um, I've got a couple of talks next week. Um, you can find information there as well. Um, so yes, thank you. And I think we turn it over to Curtis. Should I stop sharing? Thank you. Uh, no, you're you're fine to share as is, so that way folks have the. Um, if you want to talk about an image, we can go back to it. Okay. Yes. Um, well, thank you again, Dr. Pedley and Dr. Edney. We really appreciate you sharing with us this uh, tremendous accomplishment and walking with walking us through some of the uh, the processes and, and lessons learned through through putting it together. So, um, I will go ahead and open it now to the floor for questions. Um, if we've got folks who are on, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. You can use the chat box. Um, so. Uh, feel free to hop on in if you've got uh, a question. I'll, I'll get things started off. Um, the, the title of the book, Cartography in the European Enlightenment, as um, a map dealer and you know amateur historian, trying to define the Enlightenment is a real challenge. So how did you guys go about sort of bracketing your research or, or um, how did you define the parameters of what the Enlightenment was? <laughs> 
Well, I think we, we started with where volume three was, which was <laughs> cartography in the European Renaissance. And um, we felt we wanted to keep, instead of just saying the 18th century, we wanted to keep with that larger concept of the enlightenment. We also had some real concern about uh, the word science and what so in, enlightenment so often means science or scientific. And we really wanted to, to unpack um, scientific as a, as a concept, as an adjective, and uh, take, a, take away some of its, um, its use as an, as an approving adjective, that it was something else entirely, and that the Enlightenment um, really meant a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, as we tried to point out here very briefly, it was not just a chronological period, it was a period that had some definite characteristics. But I think one other aspect, and Matthew can jump in at any point, but one thing I felt was very important about this period of the Enlightenment um, was a way of thinking, a way of doing, uh, doing map making, and, and particularly in that top down map making and become allowing map making to become far more transparent. Um, one very good essay in our volume is about the writing of cartographic memoirs, how people who made geographical maps, maps at that regional or continental or world scale, often wrote down how they did it. And the, the, the transparency of writing the how-to so that a user of the map could see exactly how and learn exactly how the map was made and try to make one himself or herself um, using that same kind of method. It's the scientific method of hypothesis and working out the experiment and replicability. Can you do it over again and does it come out the same? And I think those were particularly important processes to understand in all aspects of, of scientific functioning in the Enlightenment and that applied to aspects of map making too. So we really had a challenge to explore what the Enlightenment meant. But in terms of, of bracketing it, Mary liked to use a phrase, um, you know, we, we don't start at 1650 and end at 1800. I mean, the, the, some of the examples we had for the thematic, you know, we go from 1590s to 1820. Um, Mary's phrase is a terminus flouton, a floating boundary. Um, and so there are some topics that end at about, you know, 1790, 1770. And there are some topics that end in 1820. Um, if the, if the, the sense of the, 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 the ethos of the mapping continues into the 19th century, then we need to continue it. We need to follow that trend into the 19th century. Um, so for example, um, or conversely, I should say United States. Yes, the United States exists in the 18th century. Um, the rectangular land surveys of the public land office, for example, begin the, uh, in the 18th century, the, the, um, the modern commercial trade in maps begins in the 18th century, but all very late, only in the 1790s. And so it makes more sense not to talk about those in this volume, because they're gonna, they're, they're, those are the seeds that are then gonna flourish in the 19th century. And so that way, put everything in, so, so we have a one entry on the United States um, which basically says, you want to know more, read, <laughs> read volume five. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of strate strategic editing on our part, I should say. You can't do it all at once. Yeah. Oh. You've got to leave something for volume five, too. <laughs> yes. Uh, we've got a question from Mark. Um, in creating the volume, are there any things with retrospect that you did that you, um, that you would not do knowing what you do now? Um, a quote is any intriguing but non-productive blind alleys, for instance, anything uh, that you could explore further or you wish you didn't spend so much time on? 
Yeah, we had we had some entries we that we really would have liked to have had, but we couldn't find. Uh, there was not a an author we could find, or there wasn't a volume of bibliography available. Uh, the one that I that Matthew and I've talked a lot about is the law and cartography, which is a a, a topic uh, important from uh, from well actually again from antiquity. Um, but it, it's something that there's not a, a, a coherent core uh, for an author to draw upon yet, or there wasn't an author. Um, finding, finding the specialists um, was a big challenge. I'm not sure we'd do anything differently. We had wonderful help um, from various teams of advisors that we mentioned in the acknowledgements. Matthew, can you think of anything, any, I think, I think there, there are a few instances, a few topics that as we really got into the volume um, that we realized should have been present that we didn't even think about and our advisors didn't think about for that matter. And in forests. Remember forests? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like forest mapping. Yeah, um, we should have had an entry on that. We should have had a, a bigger conceptual entry about the role of forest mapping uh, and forest science generally um, in in the 18th century. Um, I was always very frustrated. I just couldn't find anybody to do literature on mapping. Um, there's lots of people interested in literature in the early modern period and mapping, and mm -hmm. lots of people interested in mapping in the Romantic period and the Wordsworth and so on. Uh, in the 19th century, 20th century, but the 18th century um, was rather fallow in terms of, it's, it, it's, it's very formulaic in terms of its literature. I think there's a lot to be done, but couldn't find any way. Anyway, the forest mapping, that's the big, um, one of the big revelations. Right. Um, we've got a message from John. Are there any references to fantasy or fictional maps? And this kind of relates to, to the transition to romanticism in the 19th century. But um, he says, yeah. for example, the frontest piece yeah. of the Isle of Pines is a, is a map of an entirely fictional island. So what did you find as far as fictional or fantasy mapping in the Enlightenment? We have an entry on allegorical maps, of course, um, and on imaginary apocryphal um, places, California as an island is in there. So I think a um, person would find via the index and by the table of contents, uh, that kind of mapping, mapping of imaginary, mapping of um, mythical covered. Not though as it appears in literature so much as Matthew just said, uh, because of well, that. We do. I think there's a reference to Gulliver's Travels. Yeah, tra travel and cartography, yes. we yeah. definitely have. Excellent. One, one of the, the biggest frustrations um, in the last volumes of the history of cartography, and putting my director's hat on, is not just four, it's the whole thing, um, is that there is just so much really good stuff to be written about um, after 1650 in four, five, and six. But we have to pragmatically limit ourselves to one million words. Mm. Um, if, if, you know, volume three on the Renaissance came in at 1.3 million words for various reasons, if we were to treat volume four the same way, I've been saying you'd need six to eight million words to have the same degree of detail and coverage. And that's just gonna get even more for volume four Five, 19th century and volume six, the 20th century would have been just impossible. Um, so I think the biggest frustration in, in responding to some questions is we would love to have a great big 20,000, 25,000 word entry on, on allegorical mapping of fictitious places and that whole kit and caboodle, but we've got to really slice and dice it. So you're gonna work a bit to, to, to get all the information um, from different places, but by using the cross-references, the index. Um, and the bibliography. And the bibliography, you can do that. And at the same time, you'll learn a lot more too. No doubt. Um, 
we've got a question from Judy. Were there any specific technological changes or improvements in map production during the Enlightenment? Uh, um, map production in terms of printing or map production in terms of actually making the map? Uh, I expect both surveying or um, printing would be of interest. Well, in, in printing, copper plate was still the, the main printing, but there were innovations in terms of uh, the way the copper was treated. Uh, the two biggies I can think of are mesotint and aquatint. The big panorama of London was an aquatint process, which was somewhat different than uh, engraving and etching. Um, and uh, some real experiments with color printing um, that were that didn't go very far because it was it was so expensive. You needed a diff you either needed a different plate for every color, or you had to uh, recolor the plate by hand as you were printing. So uh, extremely labor intensive, and that drove up the price. I'll let Matthew talk about innovations in surveying instruments um, for sure. Yes. Well, for, for the majority of basic property mapping, there was not much innovation. Um, it's in the higher level work um, where the innovation comes in, in particular, uh, two, two um, particular innovations. One is the introduction of the telescope. Mm -hmm. So right in that period, um, you have uh, Hevelius in Poland, who is it Hevelius, who is not using a telescope. He's still doing everything by eye because um, the telescopes just aren't good enough to observe stars without a lot of refraction. I think that's Brahe who's- And Brahe before that as well, actually, yeah. yeah. Uh, Brahe just Go ahead. Before. Um, but by the end of the 18th century, uh, astronomers were using incredibly massively powered telescopes. Um, and the use of the telescope was coming down onto even the, the simple uh, survey instruments that your average, your average surveyor would, would be using. Um, so the telescope is one thing. The other thing which goes with that is the better, um, marking of the edge of the instrument. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, by, you know, uh, when Jean Picard is, is doing the survey of the Paris Meridian in 1670, um, he can read down to, and I'm gonna say a figure which I'm sure is wrong, but he can read down to like one minute of arc. Um, by the end of the century, uh, end of the 18th century, 100 years later, 130 years later, people are measuring down to fractions of a second of arc um, because the quality of the division of the bronze circles uh, of the horizontal circles has gotten so much bigger and the circles themselves have gotten bigger and it's wonderful. Um, the French um, have a wonderful practice through the 18th century of getting more and more and more and more complex in the mathematics of correcting all the observations. It's partly a function of how they, of the kind of instrument they use, which is, not, which is a, an octant, but the octant is at an angle. So that you're looking at a hill over there and a hill up there. And so the first correction is you're gonna turn that angle to the horizontal, um, and it goes on from there. And so by the end of the century, you get a book by Delambre. It's several hundred pages long, explaining all the detailed mathematical corrections you have to make to your observations in order to use them. And then one of the things I, I, I really learned about this is that that practice doesn't, doesn't really continue into the 19th century because right at the end of the century, the British get involved in geodetic mapping. It's really a French thing for most of the century. Um, and when the British do it, they, they delegate the task to uh, an engineer called William Roy, who's an engineer first and a, and a mathematician, he's a self-taught geodesist. And the English tradition is to use the theodolite, which has a, which has a full circle. And as an engineer, he 
he, he has this beautiful pragmatic mind. And so rather than the French who can't go up the hilltops to see because there's too many trees. So the French are going along the valleys from tower to tower along the valleys to do their triangulations, which means all the triangles are small and they're very, very um, constrained. And in England, you can't go up the top of the hills and chop down all the trees to make a, to, to, to make sight lines because the trees are valuable timber. You know, you, you can't just chop them down. But Roy had the brilliant idea, well, we'll just build a scaffold. And so he builds a scaffold, uh, actually a two-part scaffold, one scaffold to hold the instrument so it doesn't uh, move, and then another scaffold around it on which the surveyor walks. And so you can pick the instrument up and basically put it above the trees, making quite sure at the same time you're always directly on over your, your key point. And so you can see far longer, far more easily, far more detail, and you can map it like this. And all of your corrections that you need if you're a French map maker using a, a quadrant, they all just disappear because the engineering mentality is what fixes it. And that's the system that gets picked up in the 19th century and used by everybody um, into the 20th century. Um, so, so I was taking this sort of French idea of geodesy and giving it a good dose of Anglo-Saxon um, pragmatism. Um, and you end up with modern geodesy uh, with then German mathematics from Gauss. But anyway, um, that's, is, that's the kind of story that I hadn't really appreciated before editing volume four, even though I knew all the stuff about geodetic surveying in the 18th century. Um, it really sort of comes home when you do the work <laughs> for the volume and you start reading other people writing about geodetic mapping. Um, Long-winded answer, my apologies. <laughs> Great answer, we appreciate it. Um, so volume five is in the works. Um, okay. We got a question from Kay, apart from a congratulations. Um, you know, can you share with us what's next? Have you considered uh, an audio visual companion? You know, what, what's, what's the next steps for the history of cartography? Um, David Woodward and Brian Harley had the idea for the history of cartography project in 1977 by, for the history of cartography series. Um, they thought it was going to be four volumes totaling one million words. That's 250,000 words per volume. And they blew that budget almost immediately. Um, I have commitments from people to see through the production of volume five. By the time five comes out, I'm going to be, I'm ready to retire. Uh, <laughs> a lot of other people are already ready to retire, um, who are involved. Uh, I want to see the finish of David and Brian's vision uh, in all six volumes and umpteen million words of it uh, as, as, as it's grown. Um, and if anybody else wants to do something like an audio visual system, great, go do it. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Um, any other questions, um, comments, thoughts? Um, I did have, I, I had one question. I found it was interesting that each, um, each series or each volume in the series has different primary editors. And so I was curious as to, um, what's your involvement with the other volumes and how did you feel like you are obligated to develop a continuum of, of cartographic scholarship or research. I know you had mentioned, mm. uh, Mary, you know, you sort of lift off from the, the previous volume, but mm. transition like. Well, well the we comment about the, and say the, 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 the turn to creating volumes that are in encyclopedia format. That was a major, major uh, decision that David Woodward was, was part of. Um, so the first three volumes, as you know, are extended essays in form. And because the, as Matthews just pointed out very well, the, the, the size was just growing too big. And, and an encyclopedia format can, you can 
it has a real advantage of a kind of precision of design that the, that the rather loose form essay doesn't have. So making that switch in which uh, David Woodward, Mark Monmonier, Matthew, I, and Roger Kane as editors were all part of, um, and part of going to Encyclopedia Boot Camp to learn how to design an encyclopedia, which, which is a, a, an extremely interesting exercise in and of itself as an intellectual exercise. So that, that was a major change. Um, if that helps answer your question about how, how did we kind of manage to do these things. So I'd say these last three volumes, we've all worked together uh, very well. I can see Mark is just reminding us of the Hicks. The Hicks are, are the hierarchically integrated conceptual clusters that every encyclopedia has as its, as its undergirding. And when Matthew showed you that image of the end papers, which, which are in volume six also, uh, volume six also has these same conceptual clusters that that from which the entries hang, there, there is this design behind it. And it's a, it, it's a, the encyclopedia of course is a pure, it's a wonderful enlightenment, um, in, not invention because there were encyclopedias before, but to have this hierarchy is an, is an enlightenment uh, idea of creating this, this model of a, of a tree or of, um, of a diagram of how ideas are related to each other and how practices are related to each other. So that was very formative for us. And this point is really important because the, it's not just the pragmatics of getting um, a volume, keeping a volume to one million words, only one million words. I mean, this is the, um, but it's also a, a point that in three in particular, to some degree, well, volume two, some degree volume one, are structured around um, certain regional context, national context. So in volume three, um, there's a series of essays about French mapping. There's a one entry on marine mapping by the French, another on French engineers, another on French colonial, um, and so on. A series of mapping, series of chapters on British mapping, one chapter on Portuguese mapping, but it's really big. And it, within that chapter, you go through marine mapping and regional mapping and property mapping and so on. Um, and in volume three, the regional context, the regional distinctions make sense because by and large, mapping is not quite in, um, internationalized yet in, in, in its practices. When we come to the 20th century, volume six, um, cartography is thoroughly internationalized. Um, you, look, you, you, you pick up a modern regional atlas, um, pick up a bunch, you know, one from Japan, one from Russia, one from, from France. And they're all basically the same. The typography is different because the languages are different, but the layout of the maps, the nature of the maps, the kinds of maps are largely the same. So one of the things that we, we were looking at as we moved from um, the, the earlier volumes, the later volumes, is the need to like turn everything on its side. So rather than going by nation and then by type of mapping, by moving to by type of mapping and then by nation or by continent, uh, we could make that shift as you as a rolling forward from volume three into volume six of increasing internationalization. And so in volume four, you can see, especially if you look at the military mapping entries, um, all sorts of points where people are moving back and forth. You see the same people working for the French, working for Italians, working for Austrians. Um, the internationalization begins there. Uh, and it's going to pick up more strongly in volume five, and then even more so in volume six. So there's a, so the, the, the encyclopedic design required this hierarchically integrated conceptual cluster structure that's going to be applied equally to all three of the encyclopedic volumes. Um, 
and I think it's worked and it seems, it seems to be working with volume five. Anybody who's interested in further talk about the design or the, the creation of an encyclopedia, Matthew and I did a talk that's on, that you can find a link to on the website that we did last month about designing an encyclopedia as it applies to volume four. So that link is in the History of Cartography website to, to see that talk. Just in case we've got any ambitious members who want to <laughs> in so, case you want to design an encyclopedia, here's how you do it. <laughs> I will never do. I will never do another one. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you how to do it, though. <laughs> <laughs> One's enough in a lifetime. Yeah, on the sizes. I will probably say the same. Um, well, any other questions, um, comments, thoughts, anything anybody would like to share? Um, while we do have this this quick minute together, I just wanted to give another shout out um, again. Thank you to Dr. Pedley and Dr. Edney um, for this tremendous presentation. It's it was really wonderful. I'm sorry that we weren't able to do it in person in at the Newberry over a glass of wine, but uh, hopefully we'll still be able to meet up there again sooner rather than later. Hope so. Yes. Um, I did see Art and Jam Ron. Um, Yes. Thank you again for the whole time lectures last week. That was spectacular. I'm not sure if anybody was able to catch that, but Tom Patterson really did a wonderful job. Um, and so thank you again to the whole timers for sponsoring that uh, as well. We had, a, we had a really lovely time. So um, anybody else have anything that they'd like to share um, comments or questions? All right. Well, um, Oh, we've got uh, a comment from Professor Mon Mon Monnier. Mm -hmm. um, volume four was moving ahead before volume six by half a year at least. So <laughs> that's the. Uh, are you discussing the, the the process by which they were published? Yeah, Mark. Why don't you take your mute off? You can jump in. Just um, the information, um, um, the organization, uh, volume four, I think, greatly informed volume six. Volume um, four was more complicated in the sense that you were dealing with a lot of contributors uh, who did not um, speak or write well in English. And English was much more widely uh, useful. Um, in terms of being able to find contributors for volume six. I think your strategy for volume four was to find um, informative contributors and ask them to write their entries in their own language yes. and then to have it translated. And that apparently worked well. We didn't really have to do that very much with volume six. I suspect that was a tremendous step as far as, as the amount of work that was required and, and revisions necessary and, and everything from start to finish. Mm -hmm. It was. It yeah. was a. It was, and it was definitely worth it because I think we, we, we enlarged the community of the history of cartography by so doing. We got out of some of our nationalistic ruts, um, and it also uh, it, it it involved younger scholars, which is always a very good thing. And it also introduced, I think, Matthew and me both to a wide, wide range of bibliography that we did not, uh, that we couldn't have known about without having uh, scholars who are really both close to the archives, close to the material, and close to uh, other written work in their own language. So uh, the translation part was was challenging as it always is, but uh, but everybody worked hard at it, and and I think um, I think we're, we're pleased at the end of, with the product. It's it seems fitting that the cartography in the European Enlightenment would have uh, such a robust international component, since that's really when globalism was was becoming to the forefront. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, thank you guys again. It's been a real pleasure. Um, if nobody else has any other questions, we'll let folks um, drop off. As um, with our other presentations, be sure to keep a lookout on the Chicago Map Society YouTube page. Um, and we'll be sure to send over a copy of the recording for, uh, for you folks as well. So uh, 
Thank, Thank you. you. And I hope you all have a wonderful night and we look forward to the next um, scholarly presentation. So thank you again. And I look forward to seeing all of you sometime in Chicago, hopefully yeah. maybe next year. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you thank everyone you. in Chicago. Bye-bye. Bye all. Bye-bye. Oh, I should stop sharing as well. Mm -hmm.